So you have had, you have been a, a storyteller your entire career. You've played a role in bringing some of the greats to the stage, most recently the revival of Torch Song. Um, we'll be talking a lot about the frontiers today of LGBTQ progress in attaining equality. And just from the vantage point of a storyteller, what role do you think that our stories, our culture, has played in the advancements that we have seen to date in that equality? I think uh, when you see yourself on stage or on screen, it gives you permission to live. It gives you a place to put yourself. When uh, I was in high school in 1982, uh, my mother took me to see a play called Torch Song Trilogy that she had seen and thought she should take me. And the character Arnold, played by Harvey Firestein, was the very first gay man I ever came in contact with. And I watched him stand firmly and make the world come around to him. And that's how I learned how to be gay, by playwrights, by authors. I read books. I built up my gay self-esteem from storytelling. And that's, I think, the beauty of what we can do when we put, our, put each other on stage. Hmm. So most recently, um, you have been a producer of the revival of Torch Song, and right. congrats on your Thank Tony you. nomination for Best Revival. Thank you. Um, I understand that you have a particular, that that play, um, the original Torch Song trilogy, played a right. particular role in your own development as a gay man. Tell, tell me about the role that it played for you. So in 1982, nobody was talking to my suburban mother about gay people, and she out of her own um, humanity, took me to see Torch Song Trilogy. And at the end of the play, I had not told my mother I was gay. I had not told anybody I was gay. And she took me to see the play. And at the end of it, there is a battle between Arnold, uh, played by Harvey Firestein, and the mother, where the mother basically says, if I knew you were going to turn out gay, I wouldn't have had you. And after the show, my mother took me to dinner and said, if you ever came home and said you were gay, I would never react like the mother in that play. And that's her saying, I want you to go have your life and you will be safe at home, I promise. Hmm. It was extraordinary. Now, your next big project is that you were the author of a forthcoming book to be published in January 2020 called yes. Gay Like Me. Um, tell us about the book and why you decided to write it. You know, our, uh, my husband, Jordan, is here, and our 18-year-old uh, son, when he was 15, told us he was gay. And I was thrilled. I always wanted him to be gay. My greatest wish <laughs> was for, well, don't we all want our children to be gay? Uh, they never leave you. I, uh, and I was so excited. And then I started like clocking in my head all of the things I had to tell him about. Oh, I have to let him know about prep. And I have to, le oh, I better warn him about Grindr. And <laughs> <laughs> seriously. And, and then I, as these things were piling up on my list, Donald Trump was elected. And all of a sudden, it wasn't that fun anymore. And I got really afraid that things are going to be harder for him as a gay man in America than they were for me in 1983. Mm. And uh, so I wrote this book to say, here's what it is to be a gay man, and here's what it takes to be a gay man in America right now. And it's called Gay Like Me. Mm. Available for pre-order on Amazon. <laughs> And <laughs> Barnes and Noble. <laughs> um, when, when were you your son's age? When were you Jackson's age? Uh, I, was, uh, I was 15 in uh, 1980. In 1980. And I mean, 1980. I, that was, I was 15. When I, went, when I moved to New York City, I was, I was 17. 17. Right at the start of the AIDS epidemic. I, exactly. Um, I mean, that was a really rough chapter. It was harrowing. And yet, you say that you are worried that his experience will be harder 
Uh, I, look, was. There is, uh, Donald Trump has declared war on the LGBT community, and it is akin to a nuclear war because we will be dealing with the radioactivity for decades uh, because of the judges he's getting in uh, place and because of these laws. There are over 100 anti-LGBTQ bills in state legislatures. There are 45 anti-LGBTQ hate groups in America. We are not educating our youth about their history or about how to take care of themselves or how to take care of their partners. To me, that is harrowing. When I came out in, in 1983, nobody knew who we were. We were fighting even to be seen. Now, they saw the White House lit up in rainbow. They saw our liberation, and they will not let us have it again. That's my fear. Hmm. How do you think that your son's experience, your older son's experience, Jackson's experience of being gay will differ from yours or be similar? So one of the reasons I wrote the book is he thinks being gay is not a big deal. And I think he doesn't think it's a big enough deal. And that's where our tension is. Uh, I think being gay is the best thing about me. It is the most important thing about me. It's the blessing of my life. And I want that for him. And if he says it's not a big deal, that to me says he's not taking full advantage of the gift that it is. And I want him to have faith in his gayness. I want him to rely on it, invest in it. And that's what the book is, to show him, here's how you build up your gay self-esteem. Here's how you have permission to, to take what is special about you, what is unique about you, and hit the gas on it. Some might say that this is progress, that the fact that being gay is only one dimension of many identities that your son can it claim. It cannot be. Mm. It cannot be that we have fought back centuries of being stigmatized by religions, that we have fought battle after battle with our government, that we have disappointed our parents, all just to get our liberation so that we can say being gay isn't a big deal. That would be heartbreaking. It would be devastating. I don't want to celebrate being gay just one day at the end of June every year. I want to be able every day to say, this is why I am as successful as I am. This is why I have a beautiful family. This is how I think. This is how I feel. This is how I crave. It all comes from this well of my gayness. And if we're going to get to our liberation just to say gay is, a ma is just a matter of fact, then we're colluding with our adversaries. Tell me more. What would you say? Uh, to a, a young kid who asked you, um, why is being gay such a special, such a gift? Well, first I would say I'm thrilled for that young person. Uh, I would say being gay is a gift because it is a blank canvas. It is permission to live any kind of life they want to have. It is being part of this incredible community of individuals that have exuberance and creativity, and uh, it is a life of ex incredible opportunity and full of love if you partake in it, if you put it in a corner, if you say, that is just a part of me, I don't want to be defined by it, then you're breaking your heart, and uh, that is not the way to have good gay self-esteem. What have been the most distinct challenges and the opportunities of being a gay parent of a gay kid? Well, um, one of the, you know, strange things about being, a, you know, uh, did you say as a, for a gay kid? Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. Well, um, it has been extraordinary to be able to share with him our path, my husband's path and my path, and, and be able to write a book like Gay Like Me, who to sort of lay out for him, because as I said, we're not teaching our LGBTQ youth anything. It is state-sanctioned child abuse that they sit in these classrooms and they're erased. They don't get their history, they don't get any sex ed, they don't get any 
ability to learn about themselves. So in my book, I lay out, here's the incredible marvels in history that you are now among. Claim your space. Look at the people who you are a part of. And then I lay out all this, the art and the culture that I took in to educate myself about what it meant to be other, what it meant to be gay. And that's how I built up my gay self-esteem, through art and culture. And then I sort of warned him about Grindr and all that other stuff. <laughs> I want to ask you a few questions about being a teller of our stories. Um, and to come back to this theme of the progress that we made and the progress that we have left to make, I think about the year before last. I think about the year that Call Me By Your Name and Moonlight were both released in the same year. Um, on the one hand, a reflection of tremendous progress, seeing two such different stories of uh, 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 gender expression, sexual identity, coming of age, um, take shape uh, on as brilliant a canvas as can be made for it. On the other hand, those two films for me highlight a disparity in the types of stories that get told now. Um, Call Me By Your Name, Love, Simon are very different stories uh, than, than Moonlight. And I'm curious what you see as your responsibility as a storyteller um, to carry to the stage uh, stories that show a coming of age, a coming of age narrative for folks who look like me. For right. Example. It's it, you know it's interesting because there's a difference between telling stories that aren't your own, because you know I can't write the book for you, uh, uh, but to you know theater, it, which is where uh, a, lo a lot of my time is spent, and my husband, uh, who produced Angels in America and Falsettos. We were, you know, we just saw last, uh, this, a few months ago, Strange Loop off Broadway, which was about a queer young black man. So I think the storytelling is widening. If you look on TV, Pose is completely different than anything I saw when I was growing up. And uh, Euphoria on HBO is uh, very different than what they've had on before. So I think there's, um, there's more variety. It's, it's not wide enough, and um, I, we need more. But I think it's getting better than just gay white men. As someone who has a significant reputation and influence in, in the types of stories that get told, do you feel a personal responsibility to usher this wider lens on the LGBTQ experience into the public view? Yeah, I th I, you know, my big issue is not only to get those stories told, but make sure they're being told and portrayed by the people they're about, and make sure that the actors in these shows and these um, are played by either transgender actors or gay and lesbian actors, because um, I think that's very important that we get to tell our own stories. And uh, but I, I think, to me, we're 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 beginning to see a widening of storytelling, and um, it's exciting. Mm. Um, I want to ask you another question and then in a moment turn to a few questions from our crowd. Um, but you chose a very um, particular title and reference for your book, Gay Like Me, um, uh, hearkening to an allusion, if I dare say, to the book Black Like Me. Yeah. Um, what were the parallels that you saw in these two stories? So I, I read Black Like Me when I was in junior high school. and. It was a glimpse into a world I didn't know. And it built up empathy in me. And I'm sure that's why my teacher wanted us to read it. I went to an entirely white Jewish public school on Long Island. And a part of gay like me is to give a glimpse to people who don't know what it's like to be gay in America who have no idea that I'm legally married to my husband, but I can't kiss him goodbye on the street in New York City for fear that we're going to be uh, beaten up, who don't know that gay men cannot donate blood still in 2019, that the FDA pro uh, prohibits it. So a little bit like Black Like Me, it's a glimpse into how, how it is to live as a gay man in America. Mm. 
I have only one rule for question askers, no manifestos. Ask a <laughs> interrogative question. Um, but please raise your hand if you have a question to ask Richie. Do you want me to do the poem? I might will. Okay. Hi. Um, I'm way over here. <laughs> oh, hi. Um, uh, I am I'm also the mother of an 18-year-old who has two moms. Awesome. Um, he, on the other hand, is profoundly straight. Oh. Um, <laughs> uh, would, I, I, would you advocate, if your son were not gay, would you advocate that his straightness be as defining a characteristic for him, or would you be more okay with that being just part of the rest of his life? I, I think that's a good question. Um, you know, gay like me is a permission slip for anybody who has something unique about them. And straightness is not unique, right? It, ev so many people have it. Um, so I would... <laughs> yeah. Well, like an affliction. <laughs> we have to support our straight... Uh, All are welcome here. <laughs> But I, um, my concern is, so when our son was eight years old, I had this, I woke up in the middle of the night and I was so afraid. He was eight years old and I hadn't yet taught him about riptides and slavery. And I thought, how could you be eight in America and not know how to deal with a riptide and also not know about slavery? So I made him watch Roots from the 1970s, which, doesn't hold up as well as I had hoped. And, uh, and then we taught him about riptides, that you swim alongside it, never swim into a riptide. He's now coming out into a world with a fierce current that is com of hate coming at him. And we told him, forget what we told you about riptides. You have to swim directly into this riptide. So uh, I think it's different. Uh, when you're gay, that you have to, we're not taught to feel good about it. And I, for me, being gay is the best thing about me. It is the most important thing about me. And it's been a blessing. And he doesn't have to make it the most important thing about him. It doesn't have to be, he doesn't have to say it's the best part about him. I do want him to think it's a blessing. And that's why I wrote the book, to share why it's a blessing for me. Let's take one more question right here. Hi, um, Risa Assard. I am here representing Kaboom, but Hi. question really from a personal perspective. Um, so much of what you've shared about the centrality of your gay identity to how you see your successes and your gifts and your full humanity um, reminds me a lot of what we heard from Megan Rapino this summer um, and her declaration of go gays, right? And you right. can't win a World Cup without them. And, um, how central it is to her. And I'm curious if you see um, perhaps a tidal wave of kind of other declarations and like what can that mean to this next generation? Um, can, can she and others like you pave the way for this new narrative um, for those who maybe are coming up in this current generation who don't see their gayness as um, so central? Well, I think, uh, thank you for your question. That would be amazing because my message is being gay is not matter of fact. Don't just say, I, I just happen to be gay. Gay is just a part of me. Uh, being gay is not a big deal, which our son says. If we make it the big deal it is, and if we talk about it, and if we, that's why I don't want to just celebrate one day at the end of June. I want to be able to talk about it here. And then every time someone asks me about why it is I did something or why I had a success. I want to be able to talk about how being gay is central to what happens to me every day. And I hope that will start this tidal wave you're talking about, that we're going to start making being gay the gift that it is. If you, we're 4.5% of the population. We're not a defect. We're not worthless. We're chosen. We have been given this gift, and I want to make sure that it's treated like a gift, and I want to talk about it as a gift, and I would love uh, people to join me in doing that. That would be extraordinary. With that, Richie, I'd like to invite you to read us a passage from your book. I would love to. 
I'm going to uh, point the cover out, <laughs> as my publisher would love me to. <laughs> so uh, my book, Gay Like Me, ends with uh, a prayer, my prayer to our son, really my prayer to all our children. I pray your life is full of love. I hope it includes activism. I expect you'll be of service. I hope too, through your buoyant colors you wear daily, that your life will have a vibrancy, especially now while you are young, that mine did not. I hope you'll try, and if you fail, try some more. I wish you to be loved the way I am. I want you to know the glory is in the doing, not in any reward, financial gain, or accolade. I want you to aim high, because if you aim for the middle, you will find it. Take time to think. There are no no-brainers. Crave responsibility. It is where the living is. Always want the ball. Be kind. Being kind is like warming up your voice before singing or stretching before an athletic activity. Being kind opens you up to be ready for anything. And being kind to people makes them feel valued. When you are ready for anything and valuing the people around you, the possibilities of what you can achieve are endless. Don't look down on anyone unless it's to help pick them up. Strive to be curious, not just capable. There is not a finite amount of success in the world. Be the student most likely to want everyone to succeed. In our loaded for bear world, where seemingly everyone has become a disciplinarian, teach, don't lecture. Guide, don't demean. Bolster, don't belittle. Honor your parents by being yourself and all of yourself, living fully and unapologetically. Comfort when needed and cause discomfort when required. Care for and about yourself. Care for your friends and your family. Care for our community. You are leaving home to join the greatest of odysseys, taking off on a magical and mysterious adventure. You are on the precipice where so many men before you stood. Jump. Jump as high and as far and as wide as you can. Daddy Jordan and I are wa here watching with utter wonder. Richie Jackson. Thank you very much for joining me. Thank you.